evening and welcome to NTD News. I'm Stephanie Cox. Here are today's top stories. The CDC says a virus vaccine could be manufactured in a matter of weeks. Officials say the FDA could approve it for public use around the same time. The Gulf Coast is facing severe damages from Hurricane Sally. Heavy rain, massive flooding and extremely strong winds are battering the region. Talk about the country's political climate seems to have found its way into some classrooms. One professor was reassigned after a student spoke up about the issue. In China, conflicts between vendors and urban management officials are common, but now one fruit vendor is fighting back. And a senior Chinese tech engineer delves into how the communist regime controls the country's media narrative. President Trump tonight promised the largest and fastest vaccine distribution ever. He says the country is on track to deliver and distribute it by mid-October, as soon as it passes the trial stage. He added that as soon as the FDA approves it, they'll distribute 100 million doses by the end of 2020. Uh, today, my administration released our detailed national vaccine distribution plan. And uh, that includes a plan to ensure that we swiftly deliver the vaccine directly to America's senior citizens in nursing homes. And it's uh, all set. We have our military lined up. Everybody's lined up. And we think that's going to go very nicely. We're very close to that vaccine, as you know. He said his administration has delivered rapid testing devices to over 13,000 certified nursing homes nationwide. The president says the rate of positive virus tests results is down across all age groups and that 1.5 percent of emergency room visits are due to the virus. According to Trump, the fatality rate of the virus has fallen 85 percent since April. And the CDC and the Department of Health and Human Services announced in a Senate hearing that a CCP virus vaccine will be out before the year is through. The two agencies also expressed concerns of political interference from the White House. President Trump recently claimed that within three to four weeks, the country will get a vaccine for the CCP virus. During a Senate hearing, an assistant secretary of the DHHS agreed, saying it is possible. Robert Cadlick did clarify that after it's manufactured, it would still need to be approved by the FDA for it to be available to the public. So if and when, whether that's two weeks, three weeks, two months or four months, once a uh, clinical trial is complete, and that scientific data is reviewed by the FDA and approved, then we have vaccine potentially available immediately to use. Since early 2020, the DHHS has helped to accelerate vaccine development. The agency has given over $13 billion to medical countermeasure projects, seven of which are vaccine projects. Three vaccine candidates are now in the third phase of clinical trials. The director of the CDC, however, said the vaccine will not be widely available until next year. If you're asking me when is it going to be generally available to the American public so we can begin to take advantage of vaccine to get back to our regular life, I think we're probably looking at third, late second quarter, third quarter, 2021. At least two senators expressed concern over alleged political influence in decision making within public health agencies. They questioned whether there was any talk from the Trump administration to downplay the virus or reduce virus testing. But Admiral Brett Giroir said that he found no political interference. I, I have not seen anything out of CDC, um, HRSA, any of the agencies I work with that is anything but people acting in, their, in the best interest of the American people. The DHHS has established federal surge testing in 19 different sites, helping to quash emerging outbreaks typically among asymptomatic young adults. The nation will surpass 100 million viral tests completed this week. Democratic presidential nominee Joe Biden has laid out his plans for a safe CCP virus vaccine. It includes a national mask mandate. Biden said he will use an executive order to enforce it if it is legal to do so. Biden spoke from his home state of Delaware this afternoon after a meeting with public health experts. He cited CDC Director Robert Redfield, who said this morning that wearing a mask could be more protective against the virus than a vaccine. 
And while everybody turns a blind eye to the ballooning U.S. federal debt, a new study shows that Joe Biden's budget may lead to a $2 trillion increase in the federal deficit over the next 10 years. Biden's plan includes the highest levels of government spending in decades. Our reporter Kevin Hogan spoke with an economist about the impact Biden's budget would have on working Americans. According to a study published this week by the Penn Wharton budget model, Biden's budget would increase federal spending by over $5 trillion over the next decade, but only collect $3.4 trillion in new tax revenue. The study says that although it would put the U.S. into greater debt in the next 10 years, Biden's plan would decrease federal debt by 2050. The analysis shows that about half of the tax revenue will come from corporations. Progressives argue big shot investors will bear the brunt and thus the wealthy will lose money. Yet economist Thomas Hogan explains that investors can easily take their money elsewhere, which means the workers take the hit. It's hard to pass on that uh, cost of higher taxes to consumers. It ends up following, falling largely on employees. It's harder for an employee to move to another company. And so the uh, tax increase largely gets passed on to workers. And so you have this. The study expects Biden's budget would lead to an increase in the federal deficit by $2 trillion over the next 10 years. A deficit leads to an increase in federal debt because when there's a shortfall, the government has to borrow money by selling government bonds. More debt inevitably means more taxes, and as Hogan explains, this leaves less money for companies to invest in their businesses and hire new workers. The government's going to be borrowing more, and that is less money that is flowing to private businesses that are going to be able to expand their businesses and hire new workers. So it's, you know, it's bad for people in terms of having fewer jobs and lower wages, and it's also bad for investors that are potentially going to earn um, lower uh, rates of return on their investments. At the end of 2019, the federal debt was just over $20 trillion, about the same amount as the U.S.'s GDP. Biden's budget is expected to increase the national debt by about 10 percent by 2030. Hogan explains that if the U.S.'s debt becomes too big, investors may be afraid the debt can't be paid off, and so they may be less likely to invest in the U.S. and could move their money into other countries. So we have the advantage that, that uh, foreigners are more willing to invest in the United States, but that won't last forever as our debt continues to increase. It makes it more likely in the future that we might potentially have to default or face a situation where we might have to drastically cut spending very quickly rather than trying to keep it at a sustainable level over time. Biden's campaign did not immediately respond to a request for comment. As a percentage of GDP, the U.S. debt has not been at the height it is now since the end of World War II. Kevin Hogan, NTD News, New York. The Justice Department has charged five Chinese residents in an international hacking scheme. Prosecutors say they allegedly targeted more than 100 companies across a range of industries. NTD's Miguel Moreno has more on those charges. Charges were issued against five alleged Chinese hackers and two Malaysian businessmen accused of taking part in their criminal money-making project. According to the DOJ, the hackers went after a swath of businesses. The Chinese defendants targeted well over 100 victims worldwide in a variety of industries and sectors that are sadly part of the standard target list for Chinese hackers. They allegedly targeted social media, telecommunications, and many other types of companies. Rosen says a backdoor hack called a supply chain attack turbocharged their scheme. This is when a hacker infects the code of a product at the source, adding a backdoor for the hacker. Then that infected product is downloaded by customers. These intrusions allowed hackers to steal source code, customer account data, and personally identifiable information. At this point, these are just allegations, but Rosen called out the Chinese Communist Party for not working with U.S. prosecutors in taking down the alleged criminals. I would be thanking Chinese law enforcement authorities for their cooperation in the matter, and the five Chinese hackers would now be in custody awaiting trial. Unfortunately, the record of recent years tells us that the Chinese Communist Party has a demonstrated history of choosing a different path that of making China safe for their own cyber criminals as long as they help with its goals of stealing intellectual property and stifling freedom. According to the DOJ, the Chinese defendants also targeted foreign governments and pro-democracy politicians in Hong Kong. Last week, the White House National Security Advisor said the Chinese regime has the biggest program to interfere in the 2020 U.S. election.
Miguel Moreno, NTD News. Residents are experiencing historic and catastrophic flooding along the Alabama-Florida coast. Hurricane Sally has hit. Trees are uprooted, streets are flooded, and hundreds of thousands of homes and businesses don't have electricity. Some parts of the Gulf Coast have already been swamped with almost 20 inches of rain in the last 24 hours. More rainfall is expected. The coastal resort community of Pensacola, Florida, suffered up to five feet of flooding. City police told residents not to drive around looking at damage because it's slowing their progress. The National Hurricane Center warned of possible tornadoes in the city. At Gulf Shores in Alabama, Sally's winds were clocked at over 100 miles per hour upon landfall. Along the coast, piers were ripped away by the storm surge and winds. One resident of Gulf Shores, Alabama, told a local TV station the storm terrified his family. And my wife was just crying because she never seen this before too. And my kids were scared and I told them it was going to be okay. Alabama's governor told residents not to go outside to check on damage unless necessary and to stay away from live power lines and fallen trees. Downtown Mobile, Alabama has seen a huge number of fallen trees. One resident in the area advised people not to take the situation lightly. Stay indoors. You know, don't, don't think it's a joke because it's not. Sally is the 18th named storm in the Atlantic this year. There are three named storms in the Atlantic right now, but none now threatening the U.S. except Sally. The chief meteorologist at DTN said there is only one name left to give to a storm, Wilfred. After Wilfred, they have to use the Greek alphabet. More than a quarter of oil and gas production in the U.S.'s Gulf of Mexico remains shut on Wednesday. Oil and gasoline prices rose because of the drop in production. College football teams that are part of the Big Ten Conference will begin playing again in October. It's a move that was supported by President Trump. The Big Ten Council of Presidents and Chancellors voted unanimously to resume the season on October 23rd. They voted after being presented with information by a task force about returning to competition safely. Strict rules are being put in place to try to curb the spread of the CCP virus. Coaches, athletes, trainers and others must be tested daily for the virus starting September 30th. All athletes who test positive must undergo comprehensive cardiac testing, including MRIs. Players who test positive cannot return before 21 days have passed following a positive result. Players can only return if cleared by a cardiologist. If too many players and others test positive, teams may have to stop regular practice and competition for at least seven days. President Trump said he supports the planned return of the Big Ten season. He added that it's his honor to have helped it come back. A growing number of lawmakers are calling on the Department of Justice to investigate Netflix. It's over the release of a controversial new film. Representative Ken Buck and Representative Andy Biggs expressed concern over the film Cuties in a letter to the Department of Justice. The streaming service released the movie on September 9th. The film is titled Mignon in its original French and centers around an 11-year-old Senegalese immigrant named Amy. She lives in Paris and joins a group of dancers called the Cuties at school. According to a description of the film on the Sundance website, Amy and her friends start to practice a risque dance routine that they hope will help them win a local dance competition and ultimately become famous. Buck and Biggs claim the film features young girls in an inappropriate and sexualized manner. They also argue the young actresses may have been exploited in the production process and that the film normalizes sexual abuse of children and pedophilia. Netflix has defended Cuties and said that people should watch it before opposing it. Director Maimuna Ducare also defended her film this week, saying it's a social commentary on the treatment of young girls. Up next, the Big Apple is experiencing severe financial stress. In response, Mayor de Blasio is furloughing himself and almost 500 of his office employees for a week starting October. And we take a look at two cases of teachers talking politics in the classroom. One, a college professor, the other, a fifth grade teacher. Find out more when we return. And New York City Mayor Bill de Blasio will put himself and his entire office on furlough for a week. It's an effort to offset the city's massive budget shortfall. Mayor Bill de Blasio announced plans to furlough himself and 495 of his office employees. 
So I'm announcing that as of October 1st, uh, every, every mayor's office employee will be taking a furlough, and that obviously includes myself. Between October and March, staff will be required to take a week-long unpaid furlough. According to the New York Times, de Blasio plans to work without pay during his own furlough. The move, which de Blasio says will save around $1 million, represents part of a 12 percent cut to the office's 2021 budget. De Blasio says the pandemic has caused the city to lose $9 billion in revenue and forced a $7 billion cut to the city's annual budget. The mayor has also warned that he might have to lay off 22,000 employees if the unions in the city fail to negotiate savings. Some question if this savings plan is enough and why a solution has not already been found. According to the New York Times, Andrew Ryan, the president of the Citizens Budget Commission, said the mayor should already have a plan in place and management to labor should have already worked on a savings plan. Mayor de Blasio is also seeking greater borrowing power from state lawmakers in Albany, New York State's capital, who have resisted so far. The FBI says a suspect has been arrested after a federal security guard was shot in Phoenix. The shooting took place yesterday morning near a U.S. courthouse. A federal security officer was wounded outside the U.S. courthouse in downtown Phoenix on Tuesday. A person was later taken into custody. The officer was shot in their protective vest and taken to the hospital, but is expected to recover. A Phoenix council member wrote on Twitter, if you didn't think it could happen here, it just did. A federal officer was just shot in front of the Sandra Day O'Connor federal building in a drive-by attack. Make no mistake, this is a direct result of the extremist anti-police attacks we have seen from BLM and Antifa across the country. This insanity needs to stop. Police released a photo of a car they believed was connected with the shooting. They later found a car matching its description in a downtown Phoenix neighborhood. The FBI has taken over the investigation and said there is no threat to the public and that it won't give any more details as it investigates. The city councilman confirmed that the police department will move to two-person patrols because of the incident. A reward of $275,000 is offered for information about the shooter who opened fire on two Los Angeles County deputies this past weekend. As authorities search for the suspect, the victims are expected to survive in what officials are calling a miracle. Bravery under fire. Video shows a female Los Angeles County deputy applying a tourniquet to her partner shortly after the two were ambushed and shot several times Saturday by a lone gunman. There is no place in our society for the violence that we saw. Um, you know, blessed be the peacekeepers. The deputies were both in intensive care Tuesday after suffering wounds to their heads and arms. There's definitely going to be a, a very painful path for them, but thankfully no vital organs and so their prognosis is good. As the deputies are hospitalized, one local activist voicing support for the act of violence. This right here lightens my heart, right? Because, you know, the sheriff department has murdered too many of our brothers and sisters. This is a start of retribution then I think this is a very good start. That's a stance denounced by officials. There is no excuse for that. There is no excuse for the violence against the officers, period. We have bad apples in every organization, just as we do in law enforcement. We hold them accountable. I'm not going to tolerate anybody crossing the line. But at the same time, I'm not going to throw out the overwhelming majority of deputies who are doing the right thing for the right reason. We and talk about politics seems to be making its way into some classrooms. A couple of viral videos show how a college professor and even a fifth grade teacher have talked to their students about the 2020 elections. NTD's Melina Weiskup brings us more. A Suffolk County Community College student recorded her humanities professor talking poorly about President Trump during class. Well, he's had four friggin' years of a chance and he's done a crap job and he's really ruining our country. Many of you, this may be the first time that you're voting. Um, I'm sorry it's such a contentious situation that you're being thrusted into. Um, if any of you do still think Trump... Um, you know, is a good person, I beg you to not only go into your heart center and think about this a little more, pull up all the stuff that he's been doing. 
She went on to say that Trump is turning America into a dictator type of situation. We asked the professor for a comment, but she did not immediately get back to us. The college said they do not condone electioneering by faculty in the classroom. The student, Jessica Salvatore, spoke up about the issue, which led to the professor's reassignment. I would never succumb to that. You know, if something's not right, I will speak up on it, and I encourage other people to do the same thing. Jessica tells us some of her classmates thanked her for speaking up because they felt uncomfortable, too. She says she wasn't surprised that this happened, given the general environment on campus. Yeah, this one student I spoke to actually got a failing grade because he wrote from his conservative perspective instead of a liberal one. It's, it's not an uncommon thing to see, which is sad. And her father tells us he's disappointed because he calls the move an attempt to make his daughter feel less than a good person for not sharing the same views as the professor. I don't think it was fair for this teacher to tell her, you know, you need to look inside your heart. What, is she not as, not as much of a human being as you are? You're a better person than us? That's ridiculous. He says that college should be a place to teach students how to think for themselves, not what to think. And we also found that talk about politics has even gotten into a fifth grade classroom. If Biden gets elected, we'll have a woman vice president, and that's, as, that's one chair away from president. I'd like to see a woman president. The comments on the video showed that this occurred during a gifted history class at an elementary school in Florida. A grandmother posted this video on September 10th, and the anonymous source that shared it tells us Facebook has since deleted it. Reporting by Melina Weiskopf, NTD News. Coming up, conflicts in China between vendors and urban management officials are common, but now one fruit vendor is fighting back. And a senior Chinese tech engineer tells us what he thinks the communist regime's biggest issue is. Find out how the CCP controls the media narrative and more after the break. Now we turn to China, where one fruit vendor is fighting back against urban management officials. She's claiming self-defense, but her case rests on a leaked surveillance tape. NTD's Tiffany Meyer brings us more. Now we take a look at a fruit vendor who fought back against a member of the Urban Administrative and Law Enforcement Bureau in a Chinese city. These people are not police, but have some of the same rights as police, and they are commonly called Chen Guan. Yang Li from the southwest Chinese city Chongqing was violently beaten at her shop last week by a Chen Guan. This video from inside the shop shows Yang wearing stripes, facing a group of Chen Guans at the entrance of the shop. One of them attacks her. She turns and is chased into the shop. Yang then grabs a knife to defend herself. The Chen Guan's hand was injured. Before this happened, the group of Chen Guan had reportedly asked her to put her fruit inside the shop. As she was busy with clients, they started to move the fruit themselves. Yang tried to stop them. Conflicts between vendors and Chen Guan are common in China. Many videos online show Chen Guan smashing merchandise, beating merchants and taking away anything they sell. More than a dozen human rights activists from the same city visited Yang in the hospital Monday and sent her a banner. Reads, protecting the constitution and defending human rights. You are a good citizen and a real hero. As Yang was not well enough to be interviewed, one of the human rights activists, Tang Yunshu, introduced Yang's situation to us. The shop video was released. Under pressure of public opinion, the local authorities admitted that Yang's action was a legitimate act of self-defense. But she got a warning in accordance with the public's security management punishment law because her behavior was an impediment to the official's performance of duties. The official who had beaten Yang was detained. Another human rights activist, Wei Wenyuan, called for more details on what action would be taken against the Chun Guan who beat Yang. 
公告说是拘留啊，但是处理的结果什么叫什么名字，身份是什么，什么都没公布呀。Yang also has medical expenses to cover. As a mother of two young children, the incident has put considerable strain on her family. Reporting by Xiong Bing, Huang Yunning, NTD News. Now we turn to Hong Kong, where one doctor's Twitter account was banned less than 48 hours after posting a controversial report. The controversy centers around virologist and whistleblower Dr. Yen Li Meng. Her new report backs up claims that the CCP virus was man-made in a Chinese lab. Dr. Yen's Twitter account survived for just less than two days. A quick search for her username reveals that the account has been suspended. Before the suspension, her account boasted nearly 60,000 followers. Having posted only a handful of times, all of Dr. Yen's posts involved the latest reports on the CCP virus. Dr. Yen previously appeared in a video interview ITV, the UK's oldest commercial network. There, she asserted that the virus was created by the Chinese military inside Wuhan's virology lab, adding she would soon release a study to back up her claim with scientific evidence. Twitter has yet to give an official explanation for the suspension. But it's not the only social media known to editorialize on virus information. Looking at another of Dr. Yen's interviews, this time with Fox News host Tucker Carlson, Facebook applied a false information warning label to the video. In it, Dr. Yen discusses the origin of the virus. According to Facebook's label, the post repeats information about COVID-19 that independent fact-checkers say is false. One senior Chinese tech engineer says China's biggest problem is its lack of press freedom. Through its clever use of propaganda, the Chinese Communist Party, or CCP, aims to present an all-powerful front. In our part three of this interview, we dive into the mechanisms of the CCP's media control. William Guo has been working as a senior Alibaba technician in China for two and a half years. He specializes in the company's Ali Cloud technology for overseas clients and is a top expert in the industry. In his eyes, China's lack of press freedom has allowed its communist rule to run wild. Along the same line, the CCP doesn't allow the Chinese people to believe in the divine, instead casting itself as a god worthy of reverence. Guo says he considers many of the CCP's tactics to be quite scary. He mentioned the regime's use of digital currencies as an example. He pointed out the regime has the ability to work with the central bank to manipulate individual accounts. That makes zeroing out a citizen's assets as easy as deleting a computer document. Before, if someone takes your money away, then it's no longer your money. Nowadays, they don't need to take your money, so it's still on your account. But it's not your money anymore. Then what's left for the Chinese people? According to Guo, the older generation better understands the risk of losing their savings. That's because their previous suffering serves as a reminder. He says their experiences come from having their property taken by the CCP or seeing their family starve to death. Guo explained that his uncle died of starvation during what's known as the Great Chinese Famine about 60 years ago. His uncle was one of 30 million people who died, but it's hard for them to stand up because of fear. Despite brutal suppression from the CCP, Chinese people can still tell good from bad. The only thing is the CCP has guns, so any attempts to fight back will be ruthlessly crushed. The CCP controls the masses by controlling Chinese media and markets. Guo brought up a project conducted by an acquaintance. It involves simply collecting news released by state-run media during the CCP virus pandemic. But even something as simple as that is not allowed. He was later arrested in Beijing as a result and still hasn't been granted a lawyer. If the CCP made up the news, there must have been inconsistencies. This happened during the pandemic. There were many inconsistencies. So they have to fix these problems, and the only way to do it is by deleting the news articles. That's what we see, the 404s, the not found. In addition to attempts to erase the past, another of the regime's common techniques is to control people's ability to make Make a living. The regime knows how to intensively and effectively control you, to deprive you of freedom. It won't allow you to acquire too many skills that would allow you to make a living on your own. So there is a lack of free market economy. 
Guo says that compared to Americans, Chinese people generally lack necessary job skills and training. Limited abilities can lead to less instability down the road as the job market changes and demand for certain talents increases or decreases. It often prompts increased dependence on the government, a pain Guo says is felt by many, but that no one dares to speak up about. Reporting by Xu Wenhui, NTD News. Still to come, the Federal Reserve promises to keep its rate near zero, even if inflation is over 2%. But that wasn't enough to boost the stock market, which was mostly weighed down by tech share losses. And a House panel criticizes Boeing and the Federal Aviation Authority. It says their failures caused two deadly crashes that killed hundreds. More on that when we return. As expected, the Federal Reserve will hold its benchmark interest rate near zero through 2023. It hopes it will boost economic growth and employment. The Fed rate influences borrowing costs for everyone, including banks, home buyers, credit card users, and businesses. Lower rates usually mean more borrowing and spending, but there's always the danger of devaluing the currency or causing financial bubbles. The Fed also thinks this year's economic contraction won't be as bad as feared. It predicts the U.S. will shrink 3.7 percent. It thought 6.5 percent before. It also expects the unemployment rate to be 7.6 percent at the end of the year. It's currently around 10 percent. The recovery has progressed more quickly than generally expected and forecasts from FOMC participants for economic growth this year have been revised up since our June summary of economic projections. Even so, overall activity remains well below its level before the pandemic and the path ahead remains highly uncertain. The Fed's moves come against the backdrop of an improving yet still weak economy. The Commerce Department says retail sales rose 0.6 percent in August, the fourth straight gain but the slowest since May. And a U.S. House committee has finished its 18-month investigation into two Boeing 737 MAX crashes. It says failures by Boeing and the Federal Aviation Authority are to blame for the fatal crashes, which killed all 346 passengers and crew members. U.S. lawmakers blasted Boeing and the Federal Aviation Administration over the failure of the 737 MAX jet following two fatal crashes. A U.S. House Transportation Committee report said the crashes were not the result of a single factor, but rather what it called the horrific culmination of a series of faulty technical assumptions by Boeing's engineers, a lack of transparency on the part of Boeing's management, and grossly insufficient oversight by the FAA. Specifically, it said Boeing made faulty design and performance assumptions regarding its key safety system called MCAS. That system was linked to both the Lion Air jet that crashed in Indonesia in 2018 and the Ethiopian Airlines crash in 2019. The report said Boeing even concealed the very existence of MCAS from 737 MAX pilots. It also said the aerospace giant had withheld crucial information from the FAA and its customers in addition to its pilots. Boeing said it, in its words, learned many hard lessons from the accidents and from its mistakes. It said it had fully cooperated with the House panel and that revised design work on the 737 MAX had received intensive review. Nissan unveiled a new look for its Z Sports car for the first time in more than a decade. Dubbed the Z Proto, the company is calling the new design a development study vehicle, which means it's a near production prototype. It harkens back to the history of the model, with a hood and headlights reminiscent of the original 240Z sold under the Datsun brand name. The tail lights on the Z Proto jump forward two decades to resemble those of the 300ZX, which was popular in the 90s. Nissan hasn't confirmed the car will come to market or how much it will cost if it does. And Europe and the U.S. are teaming up in outer space. They're searching for ways to protect the Earth from asteroids. 
The European Space Agency, or ESA, has signed up to produce a new spacecraft. The contract is worth over $150 million. It's part of a joint project with NASA to explore how to deflect asteroids heading for Earth. ESA's director emphasized the project's significance. NASA plans to launch a spacecraft next June to see if they can redirect objects heading for Earth. It will aim to hit a small asteroid called Dimorphos. ESA plans to launch its spacecraft in 2024 to map the impact. They'll look at the resulting crater and measure the asteroid's mass. Dimorphos has a 170-yard diameter. That's about the width of the Great Pyramid of Giza in Egypt. It's big enough to destroy an entire city if it were to hit Earth. If NASA's mission succeeds, it will be the first celestial body deliberately shifted by a human craft. Up next, the former head of global athletics, Lamine Diak, is found guilty of soliciting over $4 million in bribes from athletes in return for covering up positive doping tests. And thanks to a genius idea of an orchestra conductor, masks, an unpopular pandemic necessity, are changed into a tool of music appreciation. More on these after the break. Over to Europe. The UK is seeing a surge in demand for COVID-19 tests, but its labs are failing to keep up with demand and can't get the turnaround needed. NTD UK's Neil Woodrow will bring us more news from Europe. Thanks. Welcome to NTD UK Newsroom, bringing UK and European news. The UK is experiencing a COVID-19 testing bottleneck after a surge in demand. Hundreds of people are lining up for a COVID-19 test outside a centre in eastern England. Some claim they've been waiting in line since 4.30 a.m. I dropped my daughter off with my granddaughter. Yeah. She was about 350 people behind all these to be told that they cannot get tested because they don't have enough. They only had enough tests to do for about 150 people. A surge in demand for tests has led to local shortages. Many say they are unable to book an appointment time or are being directed to test sites hundreds of miles away. I've got a child who's coughing. He's at a high temperature. He's supposed to be in school. What do you want me to do? Just leave him out of school for indefinite? The UK government says a new lab is opening in a few weeks and testing centres will be increasing from about 400 to 500 locations. A British child from a Syrian refugee camp has been repatriated back to the UK. Foreign Secretary Dominic Raab tweeted, safely facilitating the return of orphans or unaccompanied British children where possible is the right thing to do. Raab says each case of children trapped in Syria is assessed carefully. Save the Children says there are around 60 British children still in Syrian refugee camps, many aged under five. Many were born to British parents in Syria and have never lived in the UK. Britain refuses to repatriate men and women who travelled to Syria to join ISIS. And a German sports doctor accused of heading an international doping ring goes on trial. A sports doctor, identified only as Mark S, is accused of masterminding an international blood doping network for at least 23 professional athletes from eight countries over many years. This trial is the first one based around the anti-doping law. It's the first trial to take advantage of Germany's doping law passed in 2015. The hearing is expected to last over 20 days. The legal principles also need to be developed, which will most certainly be used as a precedent in future trials. Prosecutors say Mark S. carried out a variety of performance-enhancing blood transfusions, mostly on cross-country skiers and cyclists. He was aided by a small group of helpers who made sure drug tests were clean. The main defendant will be looking at a multiple-year sentence. Under the new law, athletes found guilty of doping or in possession of drugs can now be jailed up to three years. Doctors and other individuals providing the substances can be jailed for up to ten years. The former head of Global Athletics is convicted of corruption and sentenced to two years jail. 87-year-old Lamin Diak is found guilty of covering up positive doping tests in return for over $4 million in bribes. He is also found guilty of accepting Russian money to finance Macky Sall's presidential campaign in Senegal, his home country. 
Sol is still president of Senegal. Along with the prison sentence, Diak is ordered to pay the maximum fine of $600,000. Diak was once one of the most influential men in the sport, leading the IAAF, now known as World Athletics, from 1999 to 2015. His lawyers say they will appeal. Two young children and others make a very lucky escape in southern Turkey. CCTV footage captured the moment a driver ploughed into a shop. The incident happened in the southeastern province of Gaziantep. The driver lost control of the vehicle, barely missing two children whose parents were shopping in the area. The private news agency Demiruren reported three people were rushed to the hospital but are in good condition. And a Hungarian orchestra conductor has turned an unpopular pandemic necessity into a tool of music appreciation. Ivan Fischera's music-enhancing mask features two plastic cups shaped like life-size palms attached to the mask's strings. I got to this idea that it should look like a hand because when we put our hands here, we always understand the other person easier. We hear the consonants and the music sounds much more beautiful. Fischera's invention is proving popular with concertgoers. Dozens wore the mask as they took their seats at Friday's performance. It was clearly better with the mask on. It focused more on the music. I tried it, I took it off and put it back, and one can clearly feel the difference. The acoustic mask costs around $27 and comes in glittery and black and white versions. That's all for today. Thanks for joining us. Back to New York. Thanks, Neil. And coming up, daredevils can once again eat while dangling 164 feet in the air. Belgium's ever-popular Dinner in the Sky is back, now keeping diners two feet apart. And people in Australia are flocking to the coastline to watch humpback whales migrate. But international tourists will be absent this year amid continued travel restrictions. That and more after the break. Belgians looking for a different culinary experience are once again able to eat 164 feet in the air. The Dining in the Sky experience returns from lockdown with a new socially distanced feel. Belgium-based Dinner in the Sky has been set up in some 60 countries since its 2006 launch. It involves diners strapped into seats at a table suspended from a crane while well-known chefs cook and serve from the center. It's very impressive. At first, it's a bit scary, but once you get used to the height, it's beautiful. Plus, it's delicious. It's really something to do again and to recommend. Dinner in the Sky's original platform sat 22 people together along the perimeter. But in the pandemic, up to 32 diners will now reserve four-person private tables spaced apart. The chefs and servers also have a little more space to roam. So it means that all the public are sitting in a sort of a bubble and it's 100% Corona proof now. Dinner in the Sky offers three sittings over the coming two weeks, one for lunch and two for dinner. The price is roughly $350 per person or $175 for weekend afternoon cocktails. Turkey's first flying car briefly hovered in the air, successfully completing its first test flight. A video released earlier shows the car, Cesare, flying up around 33 feet before landing on the tarmac. Named after a 12th century polymath known for the invention of the flushing toilet, Turkish flying car Cesare is expected to reach about 1.2 miles, with a speed of 62 miles per hour. Turkish manufacturer Baykar Defense says it will take up to 15 years to see Turkey's first flying car in the skies. And in Australia, some little-known towns are seeing a surge in tourism as people search for sites like humpback whales on their way down the coast. Restricted by bushfires and border closures, locals are looking to their own land for a much-needed break and a breeze. Earlier this year, Australia restricted international travel to prevent the pandemic spread. With fewer getaway options, some choose to travel locally. The town of Eden is renowned for whale watching. So uh, it's been an absolutely amazing start to the season 
and um, we've got some good times coming ahead as well, so it'll be great. At this time of year, humpback whales are making their way to Antarctica to raise their young. They pass through waters off Eden. The town lies in an area among the hardest hit by bushfires. Those blazes destroyed 37 million acres of bushland across Australia southeast. The fires killed at least 33 people and millions of native animals. Cat Baloo's 52-foot catamaran has had fewer people on board due to the pandemic. But the whale-watching boats are back in the water, taking visitors to see the whales. Locals say the ocean mammals are increasing in number and traveling in larger pods. Uh, we're back on our feet now and uh, we're, you know, we're getting the support from you know, people from Canberra and, and within New South Wales, so that's been really great. According to the Organization for the Rescue and Research of Cetaceans, thousands of humpback whales now migrate up and down the Australian coast every year. And that's all for today's news. Thanks for tuning in. I'm Stephanie Cox.